So hello and welcome to the Dharma Life podcast. I'm your host, Aloise Serfleet Middleton. And this week I have with me a new found friend. <laughs> um, it's quite interesting actually, through this great awakening period, some new connections and soul family have come into my life. And I feel very privileged to introduce you to the lady that I'm gonna have the conversation with, Jennifer Longmore, welcome. Thank you. <laughs> well, Jennifer, <laughs> Jennifer and I met through a love of conscious Facebook posts, I suppose would be the easiest way to describe it. And we kind of reached out to one of us at another and said, we must talk. We feel like we've got a lot in common and we jumped on a call. And there were so many similarities from families to Akashic Records to Reiki to where we were at in our journeys. Um, and I just knew you guys would love to hear her story, her awakening journey. So yeah, Jennifer, welcome to our podcast. Thank you, I'm excited. <laughs> now you're an author. You are the founder of a leading Akashic Records school and you've personally done over 30,000 Akashic Records reading, which blows my mind, by the way. Uh -huh. So I would love for you to just share a little bit with, about our, with our audience about how you, because obviously to do 30,000 readings, you must have got into this work at quite a young age. Yeah. Well, I was really fortunate. I believe I was fortunate. Maybe other people wouldn't agree, but uh, my parents had such visceral reactions in their upbringing around religion because both of their respective families were trying to shove religion down their throats so they refused to do that to me and they didn't know I was going to be their only child but I ended up being their only child so they both projected all of their hopes and dreams onto me mm -hmm. <laughs> they both pr projected all of their un unmet uh, you know whatever I mean but anyways I was given the opportunity to develop my own understanding of the universe and my parents were very, very spiritual. And so we went for our first past life regression when we, when I was four. So they had a past life regression through a, a channeled group, almost like the, uh, like Abraham. And then I went in on my own and then I went in with my family because they wanted to figure out how did we all come together and why did we form this triangle? Because triangles can be really, you know, from a divine perspective, we can have the divine Trinity or the Holy Trinity. But then in 3D form, we can have toxic triangles, right? And so we were trying to avoid the toxic triangles. So uh, while my parents were having a reading, we were in this kind of commune, I guess you could say. It was like communal living back then. And I had all these adults swimming up to me in the pool. I was sitting on the edge of the pool, dangling my feet in. And they're like, hello, little girl. Why don't you tell us the meaning of the universe? And I guess I would just like spew out all of this channeled information. And... Um, so they all started swimming up and they're like, holy cow, this kid is actually channeling information. So I had, I was very telekinetic as a kid. I remember being freaked out at times when objects would be flying around my room until I learned how to control it. And then I knew how to actually ground the energy in my bedroom. I don't know if anyone else can relate, but um, I still have it to this day where sometimes all of a sudden my body feels like it's 12 feet long or 12 feet tall and my tongue will get very swollen. It's almost like I outgrow my physicality. Uh, that's probably the best way I can describe it. But anyway, so my grandfather, um, my mom's dad, solved crimes with the police as a psychic medium. So he was sending me all the Jane Roberts books, Oversoul 7, Seth Speaks, all these things when I was like seven years old. And even to this day as an adult, I get cross-eyed when I read those, but I was reading those at age seven. And my paternal grandparents lived across from a graveyard because they could buy that land so cheap. So we had actual ghosts throughout my grandparents' basement that we would go, we could physically see and we would talk to. So I had no idea that other people were not living like this. Right. And what I happened? really thought, because. What happened with your parents? Because you said about the, you, why you came together. I'm curious, like, mm -hmm. what, why did your soul family come together in this lifetime? Yeah, well, my mom and I were sisters in previous lives, and I can say that was my experience with her in this lifetime. So that's great when she felt like your sister. I don't know. 
Well, it's not great when you're a kid. Sure. <laughs> because you want a parent, right? You don't want a girlfriend that's telling you all of their problems, right? But the gift of that is that it really taught me to be a great listener. I really learned how to hold space for other people, right? Which is what I've been doing for a really long time. And uh, my dad, so in one lifetime, my mom and I were sisters in France. And uh, my dad was um, a boy in the neighboring field. And we were all just kind of friends going through some tough times with whatever was going on in the world with droughts and famine and stuff like that. So we've had many lifetimes together. It doesn't mean that we had a perfect life. If anything, the awareness just was that. It was just awareness of what we came here to work through. It didn't mean that we didn't have our struggles. Sure. And, um, and so, but the, you know, the gift was that I could be who I was as a kid mm. in my home. It was only when I went out to school that I realized, because as kids, we don't know that our home life isn't mm. like everyone oh, else's until we true. finally realize, right? Mm. So here I am, you know, like I was a kid that would always say to my parents, oh, so-and-so called and they said they can't come over for this reason. And then 15 minutes later, the phone would ring and so-and-so would call and say, I can't come over for this reason. So I was always telling people things they didn't know and freaking them out. And I could see the look on their face. And as someone who's very empathic and someone who cares a lot about people, I didn't know what I was doing wrong. I really, I could see that I was upsetting people, but I didn't know what I was doing because I had no idea that I knew things that I shouldn't have known or that, you know, was making them feel uneasy. So I spent a good chunk of my life censoring myself and trying to figure out how to be the chameleon. How do I stay in the background? How do I fit in in such a way that I don't make people feel uncomfortable? How do I ask questions or how do I make statements in the form of questions so I can you know, feel safe and not make people feel less than. And I was pretty angry as a teenager because I had this, what I viewed was a curse. And so you stayed open. It wasn't you going see, away. You stayed I, open. And yeah, you I stayed spirit. open. It wasn't going away. Yeah, it wasn't going away, but I didn't understand it. I didn't have the language for it. And then uh, in my late teens, I don't know what clicked for me, but I just thought, you know, I'm resisting this. It's not going away. What would happen if I just got curious about it? I don't have to accept it, but what if I just got curious about it? So I started going to psychic expos. I started reading books on astrology. I started, you know, touching crystals and collecting crystals and all that stuff. And then I found people like me. Oh, people speak this language. I'm not that crazy. You know, I, I knew in my household I wasn't, but that didn't matter because eventually one day I'd have to move away. And so when I was in university, I had a car accident and my mom at the time did reflexology and her, one of her closest friends did Reiki. And I didn't really have any money because I was putting myself through school. So my mom did trades with this woman. She said, okay, if you do Reiki on my daughter, I'll do reflexology on you. And so um, it was through Reiki so, so here I am overwhelmed in university and my Reiki master says to me, I think you're supposed to take Reiki with me. I think you're supposed to take level one with me next weekend or whatever it was. And my instant thought was, this is going to be another university class. I don't have time for this. What the heck? You know, I, I'm not going to bother, but something wouldn't let me let it go. And she said, I promise it's not like any class you've taken. I really feel that you're meant to be there, but you know, you'll know. And it wouldn't leave me alone. So I went. And within 15 minutes of being there, I, I still had no idea what I was there for. I had no idea what I was going to learn. But in my bones, you know, when we have frogs jump out of our mouth, <laughs> and you're like, oh, that just jumped out of my mouth. I said, oh, I'm going to be teaching Reiki. So sure enough, I went through for my Reiki mastery over time. And uh, that was my journey. But the great thing about the energy was it gave me, it kind of, brought both worlds together. It brought the intuitive stuff together with the energy stuff and being able to merge those two worlds finally gave me language and gave me, I don't know, I guess just tools that I could use that were really helpful. Now, after that, I know I told you this uh, separately, but I went into uh, work in forensics. I investigated crimes against children for many, many years. Mm. And, um, and so that's an interesting job to do when you're highly intuitive. I was going to say. when you're energetically sensitive. <laughs> and, yeah, and you've had first-hand first knowledge, haven't yeah. you, of, of all the stuff that's going on oh, now. Yeah. You've seen that behind the scenes oh, yeah. as well, which must have been horrendous. Yeah, we, um, 
I think I might have been maybe, you know, it takes about two years to learn that job, just to be proficient in the legislation and kind of understanding where your power begins and ends. It's actually a great, uh, just internally, it's a great lesson in personal power because you can't use your full hand and you can't underuse your power. So there's always this dance that you do with perpetrators, right? Around like, how do I get them to comply with me? How do I get them? What, how do I read them in such a way that I get them to tell me what I need so I can keep these kids safe? And was that a calling and, that you uh, had that you needed, that you just felt that that was where you wanted to go? Like, cause it's- No, I, did, I, I was mad. I was in university and I, I was taking all of these classes, right? And, um, but I wanted to be more like working for the office of a children's lawyer. So after the, you know, after the arrest had been made, then I wanted to be standing on trial and advocating for kids working for the children's lawyer. But uh, the government at the time changed and we had a more conservative government come in and they changed the, the um, social services model to be more of a business. And so there was a ton of cuts, like a ton of cuts. So I ended up being a frontline worker and everyone said, look, if you can just do this job for two years, you'll get any job you want because you essentially get like a PhD in 20 different subjects, right? Domestic violence childhood development, human behavior, addiction, like anything, right? Because you, you're dealing with so many um, just really fascinating people. And at the time when I was in university, I had a lot of my professors were working for these agencies and they were begging me to come and work for them. And, uh, and I was like, no, thanks. I'm good. Okay. But come and just like shadow me for a day. And I'm like, no, I'm good. <laughs> and then, you know, I end up doing it simply because I needed a job. And, um, and so I was about six weeks on the job and one of, you know, I'd been, I had done a few investigations by that point that were pretty significant, but, uh, that when I walked in and, um, I'm not going to get into graphic detail, but that's when I, I was introduced to the world of satanic ritual because I really had no idea. I was completely... It's not uh, something you would have had an experience of. No, no. I was about 23 at the time. I knew cults existed. But, you know, I guess where I can have empathy for people now is that I had so much cognitive dissonance at that age because I was going in and speaking to teachers. And I realized, oh you know, we're taught to believe that teachers have our back. And most teachers do, uh, but some of them don't. I investigated doctors and mm -hmm. especially pediatricians. Now, that's not to say that, yeah, sure. you know, it's just but to say that in every industry, there, politicians, I mean, I was never surprised when I would get called out to investigate like male singers for children. And some of them are pretty well known around the world. So I'm not going to give, give away names, but that's not surprising to me. I, I, in fact, am pretty suspect of, of certain people that want to work with young children, right? Because really the ratio is far more about male perpetrators against children than it is female, but female's still there. Anyways, um, when I, when I had the ritual case, my very first ritual abuse case, uh, and, and it was pretty, the, the scene was pretty graphic. So it's, you know, it's something that stays in your mind. That's, I kind of, I had, cog, I had cognitive dissonance when we really went through this part of the awakening, right? But back then, I really got to understand what cognitive dis, dissonance was because you, your whole world collapses. Everyone mm -hmm. you thought you could trust are actually just a bunch of children raising themselves, right? We're all adult, or we're all children trapped in adult bodies. And, and some people are um, very arrested in their development, I guess you could say, right? So just as I would investigate cops who work the domestic violence beat, and then they're going home and beating their wife and children, right? Mm -hmm. Stuff like that. Shabby. So anyways, yeah. So we, um, you know, we saw a lot of stuff. I grew up very quickly. I was already mature. Right? I was already kind of an old soul going into that job. And uh, I grew up very quickly. And it actually wasn't the clients that burnt me out. It was the system. Because it's really hard to, and I know a lot of healers right now listening can relate. When you grow up knowing what you know, you just know things, you're intuitive. Mm -hmm. And you're constantly being asked to defend yourself. Mm -hmm. Right? Explain how you know that. Where's the proof? Mm -hmm. <laughs> 
<laughs> and we get to this stage now where we're just so over that. We're like, yeah, no, you, you go do your own research. You can go do your own. You can go do your own heavy lifting around that. Um, but when you know things and you actually do need physical evidence that you're never going to get because someone's buried it or burned it or, you know, put it in a cinder block and thrown it in, in a lake or whatever, um, that, that can be very draining. And I also will say, because I know a lot of people have their heartstrings pulled right now around the children, you know, what's going on with the children and what we're discovering is that, um, you know, someone like Operation Underground Railroad has to exist because government agencies, by nature of just the energetics in them, they claim to want change, they require change of their clients, or they even demand change of their clients because some of these services are involuntary, and they are the slowest to evolve. They are the slowest to take action. They're the slowest to evolve. And so I, I don't know. I don't know the guy that runs uh, an operation on the ground railroad, but I'm guessing that he would have seen the same thing and realized that if, if he was not going to burn out and if his heart was not going to literally crack and not be repaired, that he was going to have to take control and create a third party organization to actually go and implement change. Mm -hmm. Yeah, absolutely. So, so just to recap, like born awake, which is incredible, kind of spiritual family, so that <laughs> nurtured that, and then obviously grew up, as a lot of us do, feeling a little bit weird, alternative, seeing things, and then obviously went from uh, studying Reiki into, as you said, working with forensics. So when did the records come mm -hmm. to, into play? How did you get introduced to the Akash Records? I still had a J-O-B, and I was having this recurring dream for like two weeks. No, <laughs> I know, just over broke. <laughs> and uh, really, when you're a public servant, you either have just cool. enough to pay your bills or not quite enough to pay your bills. And uh, so I had this recurring dream, and it was this beautiful, thick, like beautiful, beautiful book with gold um, edging on the pages, and it was clearly san Sanskrit. Now, I didn't know it was Sanskrit other than I kept just having this knowing that this was Sanskrit writing. And this went on for about two weeks. And these pages were flipping faster than I could read them. And I had this deep, deep knowing and almost angst, like I need to know what's in, in these pages. And the book was huge. I remember it being so big. And I looked really tired one day when I went into work and my colleague who was also very awake said to me what's going on with you and I said oh I'm tired I haven't slept so I told her about the dream and she said well Jen you know better just ask your guides and your guides will tell you what's in your in the and I was like oh my goodness why didn't that even occur to me so that night I said okay guys I need to sleep you obviously have something to tell me so please make it really clear what you need me to know and please allow me to understand it and remember it when I wake up. So in the middle of the night, I heard, these are the Akashic records. You must learn them so you can teach them. Pretty and it was a, a deep male <laughs> voice. Yeah, and, and I was like, oh, thank God. And it wasn't because it was the Akashic records. It was because I could finally sleep. Sure. Right? And so when I woke up the next day, this is how funny this stuff is because the Akashic records will just call you to them. I think most people are working in the Akashic records without knowing them. When I look back through my life, I clearly was working in them, but I didn't have that as my language and I didn't have a process yet to, to, you know, more formally access them. But uh, the next day I woke up and I said, okay, well, I would better figure this out. I'm supposed to learn about these and and uh, then I get a phone call, maybe nine o'clock in the morning from this guy asking to book an appointment with me for an Akashic record reading. And I'm like, what the hell is going on? He said, yeah, I got your name from so-and-so. And, -so, and uh, she said to contact you for a reading. Now, this woman owned a crystal store and she was a hairdresser. So she had her hair salon in one part of the store and then like the crystals yeah. and other things in the other. And very, very intuitive. Now, she didn't know I had this dream. She didn't know anything about me knowing about the Akashic records. She was guided. She, when I spoke with her after, she said, you know, basically she had a frog jump out of her mouth to tell this guy to contact me, but she oh, had yeah. no way of knowing why she was guided to do that. So I'm like, so then I'm, you know, the That's human a sign, isn't it? Really? <laughs> That's a very totally. direct sign. Like, oh my God, I've got to perform. I've got to perform for this guy. What am I going to do? And I'm like, you got to let it go. Whatever's going to come out, is going to come out. This isn't your first rodeo. You know how to do readings. And um, 
And so that was, that was my first client that day. I said, well, I don't have time today. I mean, and it's coming out of my mouth and I'm like, I cannot believe I'm letting this guy book a session with me. And uh, I don't even, you know, and then that was kind of it. And um, so the guides just kept making it harder and harder to go into work. If you've ever had that feeling, I think of most course. people have, where you just think, how many more times can I hit the snooze button before I either have to decide mm -hmm. that I'm calling the whole being Am I calling sick? What was the last excuse I gave? <laughs> and, or, you know, I'm going to have to suck it up and get dressed. So I had to take the leap and trust that the net would catch me. And because the Akashic Records are so good at pulling you to them when it's your time to learn them and or channel them, I had a pretty full roster of clients within about three months of leaving my job. So I know first world problems, right? And then about six months into that, of formally starting my business, people started asking me to teach them how to do the records. And I was like, I can't teach you. Nobody has ordained me. You know, I don't have a certificate. Nobody has approved me. <laughs> I don't know how to do this. And they're like, why are you being selfish? You're being mean. You're hoarding information. And people were getting mad at me. And I'm like, I'm, I'm genuinely trying to respect you here. I don't want to give you something that I haven't had some, you know, teacher, you know, bless me with these, these uh, certifications. And then the guides came to me one day and they said, yeah, the, don't, they reminded me of the dream. And they said, we're going to guide you through the system, but you need to carve out time and sit down and let us channel it to you basically. So I channeled the system and I taught it. And um, even pe people that are teachers now were in that very first class. So that was, I think like 15 years ago or something. And uh, so at the end of that class, they said, okay, when's level two? And I'm like, oh my God. level two. Plan a level two. What are you talking about? They're like, oh, we want a level two. God damn it. Where's our level two? And I'm like, okay. So that's how it was born. Wow. And so I, I divided it into three sections. And then every year we have an annual conference, which I call Akashic Record Level Four. So that's where I channel new information every year. And um, it's, you know, it's, it's something people really look forward to because I, I, I'm a lifelong learner and I tend to attract like lifelong learners. So every year I get cross-eyed even at the stuff that I download yeah. to the records and the rest is kind of history. Wow. Wow. Fantastic. <laughs> so <laughs> talk about being, you know, led horse to water you know literally you were kind of pointed mm -hmm. in the right direction so I feel really blessed that we've got somebody with your level of experience on this podcast and I love to make these uh, podcasts as practical in nature as I possibly can for our listeners you know everybody's on their mm -hmm. ascension, ascension journey and obviously the veil is thinner yeah. you know, it's very accessible for individuals even if they haven't done training to access the Akashic Records what advice or what is it that people don't know about the record that you could share with us that our listeners will be, you know, oh, mm. amazing. Mm -hmm. You know, I've, I've learned from my journey that I attract the experiences and I attract the clients that allow me to be a better teacher. So over the years, I, especially when I was doing readings in person, I would have people um, pass out in front of me and come to and they were speaking a different language they literally had a walk-in experience right in front of me so that i could learn okay what do you do if that happens because on a human level i don't know what to do when someone literally starts speaking another language to me and they're very disoriented and they don't know where they are and they've clearly dropped in as another being into this vessel and how do you coach someone through that so that's a perfect example of how we truly have to just surrender and trust that the guides are going to give us the tools and the, the words and, and whatever that we need for those situations. I was just going to ask a question about the walk-in experiences. Are these walk-in experiences yeah. happening on a more kind of, as we ascend, obviously we're, you know, we're, we're shifting up higher vibrations, yeah. you know, we are, our yeah. consciousness level is increasing. Will this type of stuff increase as well? Oh, for sure. So the, I'm glad you asked that actually, because it's come to my attention recently that with everything going on, a lot of people are disassociating right now. So some people are disassociating because of trauma, okay? Right? It's poking some really old wounds from other lifetimes, parallel realities, et cetera, grief. And, you know, like I, I know someone that uh, grew up in communism and they fled from China. They moved to the Western world they think they can finally take a deep breath and boom, look what's happening right now. 
There's like literally textbook how to implement communism happening right now in a lot of parts of the world. And so there's some, some healing that needs to happen with that. Uh, and then the other part of disassociation can be where you just feel like a very different person and you can't really articulate it, but you feel very disconnected from the life that you once had, uh, even the food you might have eaten, the clothes that might have felt really good on your body, or you felt really, you know, I don't know, sort of aligned when you were wearing them, and now you don't. Uh, obviously, relationships. And so, if that is the case, then that is a pretty good indication that you're having a walk in experience of higher aspects of yourself that are now showing up to help you navigate the Great Awakening. And, um, and so what you want to do is set the intention that you have a bonding and integration. So you're bonding with those aspects and integrating it fully into the now and through all of your 12 energy bodies. Uh, in case anyone is having that, I'm guessing they are because I'm talking about this. Sure. So <laughs> I'm yeah, being guided absolutely. to say it. Someone's probably needing to hear this. There's two types of walk-ins, right? One is where you literally... Um, you know, the soul that was housing a body for like 49 years decides, yeah, I'm done with this body. But if someone else wants to use this body, come on in and use this body from 49 years on and, and onwards. So we hear about that stuff when someone has, you know, heart surgery or they have an organ transplant or something like that, where they come out of surgery and they're literally a different person. And they're even their own family doesn't recognize them. That's a walk-in where it's a completely different soul. And then you have a walk-in like I described where for a few weeks, your, your highest self is basically running the show. So you're almost out of your body watching going, wow, what's happening? But um, like in those situations, when I went through it, I went through it a few times, I, my guides needed to tell me it's time to go to the bathroom. It's time to go eat. It's time to go have a glass of water because I was so disassociated from the body that I didn't, I didn't like the whole know of how my to 20s. take for it. Yeah. That really wow. don't, that, to me, that sounds like the whole of my 20s, but I thought it was from depression and drugs and alcohol. <laughs> but that's how I used yeah. to feel. Interesting. Yeah. Uh, it, yeah, it probably was. So I know for, for folks like anyone that's meant to usher in the 5D, not just come into the 5D, but people that are here to help usher others through to the 5D are going to be calling on higher aspects of themselves than just, you know, the evolution that was already present when all of this started. Anyone listening to this, I'm sure, because just what I know of you and your show, obviously was already awake, you know, to a certain degree. We might be uncovering some new things, but we, you know, can have these kind of conversations and nobody flinches or thinks they sound weird. And so for those of us that are already you know, aligned with 5D, I guess you could say, um, we will be calling in those, those aspects of ourself that uh, really need us to, to move along and to help, help the human part of us heal. Yeah. I mean, when, when all of this first happened, and I told you this when we spoke privately, I had been aware of hunting parties. I had been aware of, you know, I mean, just even by way of the work I was doing in the records, right? And sure. the stories people were telling me about things they were seeing and the records will always tell you the truth. So I could tell, you know, what was true and what wasn't. I knew that we were living in a pretty effed up world. I knew that there was evil. I had seen evil. I knew that, um, you know, 9-11 wasn't the way we were told it was. I, I knew these things back in my probably mid twenties, but I couldn't allow myself to fully go down that rabbit hole because I knew it would have changed the trajectory of my life. But when we first went into lockdown here in Canada, I think it was like March 12th or something. I had such a visceral, visceral reaction. It wasn't a sadness. It was just like, Oh my God, it's really here. All this stuff Amazing. that I knew was coming has actually come in. And I think most people can relate to this when I share this because I've heard so many people say it. I had this solar feminine rage come over me. 
wasn't like an angry human rage. It was just like, not my people, not my planet. It wasn't even me. It was like, it was almost like Gaia came up through my body and was like, yeah, no, we're not going to be holding space for this on my planet. Thank you very much. And I've heard a lot of people talk about that and people think, oh, if you're in your feminine energy, you're not allowed to be mad. I was like, no, not my people, not my body, not everyone else's body. I care less about me really at this point uh, because I've lived a pretty good life. If it's time to go, it's time to go. But I, I want a better future for our children. And uh, I want anyone I care about who's going to choose to stay on this planet to to be able to do so freely and without interference mm. yeah and i can totally relate to what you're saying it's almost like our contracts were written that you know again we're in training weren't we like our lives were training to get to this point and mm -hmm. so everything we've done has been preparing us for this great awakening and it was like i, I genuinely felt like i was contracted on a certain day to you know to wake up to an even a bigger level like like you i kind of knew what was going on mm -hmm. to a degree but not the extent of the deprivation mm -hmm. um so and, you know i'd imagine that's exactly what we signed up for um and it's interesting now that i do feel this feminine energy is really the most of not everybody but most more more women kind of transformational leaders out there at the moment doing this work speaking their truth um so mm -hmm. i just want to get back to the records and then and then kind of wrap round things up a little mm -hmm. bit but is there any advice you can give our listeners around, you know, what they can do at the moment? Because obviously everyone's keen to work in their record, to, you know, get rid of any blocks. Mm -hmm. You know, is there anything sort of simple that people can do who are listening? I appreciate it's, you know, it's a very extensive modality, but any top mm -hmm. tips? Yeah, well, I will say that I have uh, a free gift on my website where I actually have uh, a protocol of how to open the records okay. and I go deeper into the records so it's not that I'm trying to avoid it it's just you're right like it takes a bit of time to go through it but I actually have a process in there I have a book on Amazon which I think is like I don't know 99 cents or something crazy like that for my for the ebook portion which also goes into great detail about, about the records but I'll say that you know for everyone listening I I know because I just know who you're attracting, right? And I can kind of feel into the energy that everyone's at a certain level. So we really want to be, if we want to accelerate our journey right now, we're being asked to heal the shadow. And in a few years, so we're being asked to, well, what's the, in the great awakening, there's a great unveiling. And so uh, we're unveiling aspects of ourselves, good and bad, so to speak, that, you know, things we did, you know, um, values we didn't realize we had, uh, resiliency we didn't realize we had, but we're also dealing with our own shadows and then we're dealing with the collective shadows. So the quicker we deal with our own shadow stuff, we start to move the needle on the collective shadow. But what we are really uh, working through right now is sovereignty on all levels. So we are really, um, we're, we're collectively healing sovereignty and the illusions of of um, imprisonment and all the things that come along with that, right? So we're liberating ourselves on all levels. And in that liberation, it kind of gets messy. And we're seeing that because we have to dismantle, you know, in the law of cycles, we have this disruptive energy, but we also have this creation energy. And we literally have one foot in both worlds right now. We have one foot in the world that's getting destroyed because that's just part of the law of cycles in order for something new to emerge. And we've got one foot on this mountain that's trying to grow. So we have like one foot kind of rising and the other foot sinking in the quicksand, right? And it feels very wobbly and it should because it's not stable. So for our listeners then, really they could go through an exercise of looking at where they're giving away their power effectively to other people mm -hmm. and then having the understanding that actually part of the ascension process part of the ascension initiation is to really step into your sovereignty and your own personal power and actively work on claiming that mm -hmm. yeah and then you know the great thing about the records because i vet everything through the records and so for example when everyone was worried about 5g i kept getting from the guides that people don't need to worry about 5G. And I know a lot of people are wanting to spread that around because they're afraid, because they're picking up on the fear propaganda. And the fear propaganda, uh, well, really the information wars in general are, <laughs> they're really in uh, full effect right now. 
And, um, and so I, you know, I want to know the truth about it. I'm, I don't have an attachment one way or the other, but they've always said no. Um, you know, the Arcturians have designed humans. So they're in control of the humanoid race. They know our DNA, they know our emotions, they know our thoughts. They're kind of our divine AI, I guess you could say. But they have helped our bodies evolve over the years, even in spite of chemtrails and sure. you know, toxins and fluoride and stuff. They have helped us calibrate and evolve. And they are download for those of us that are choosing to stay, they're downloading quantum healing technology into our field right now as we speak while we sleep. If you're tired right now, you're probably getting, you know, and, and if you've been tired over these last few months, you're probably downloading this quantum healing technology to calibrate the cells, to be able to hold more light, to be able to um, be resilient and to be able to, I guess you could say buffer anything that's coming up the actual body, including something like 5G. Now we now know the 5G is, is, is now going to be serving us. Those towers are now being calibrated to be transmitting frequencies that are actually good for us, right? So that's going to be really cool to see how that plays out. But, uh, you know, the, the guides will tell you anything you need to know. And not unlike anything, even before all of this nonsense, we let in the information that we're willing to let in. So the degree of truth that we're willing to hold is the degree of truth that gets revealed, right? And right. so the more we raise our frequency, the more we surrender and we truly allow the truth to come in. You know, when I think of working in the records over the years, the top three questions are, what are my, what's my purpose? Where's my soulmate? How can I make more money? I have many other questions, right? But the soulmate question is an interesting one because so many people want to ask that question and that's the one question that people really resist the truth on. Now I share this because it's the same with what's going on right now. If we don't want to hear the truth, we're just going to turn our cheek anyways, or we're going to ask questions in such a way that doesn't really allow us to see the truth because we don't want to hear it. And so we're going to learn some things that you know, about the world that we thought the world was the way it was, and it's, it's not. Uh, but we're also going to be given the tools of how to navigate all of this. We're going to be given the physical recalibration we need. We're going to be uh, allowing our emotional body to, to return to a state of equilibrium. We're going to be able to program our mind to hold the thoughts that we do want to have. We're obviously going to be able to connect spiritually to truths, not just for us, but for this planet, for this galaxy, and for anything happening outside of this galaxy, because I think most people listening to this would know that really what's playing out on this planet are just old Angus school Randy. galactic wars that are just tying themselves together, right? They're just coming. There's a, a, a completion cycle. Absolutely. For some of these unfinished wars that were happening on other planets and between different um, species, I guess you could say, that don't always hold the highest light for all. <laughs> Fantastic. Thank you. I'm going to have to wrap things up just purely because we have been talking for so long. We could probably keep talking <laughs> so much. So, wow. so, 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 so much to discuss. But no, thank you so much. Like, fascinating conversation. And where can people find you and connect with you? Well, if people go to my website, so that's souljourneys.ca forward slash soul, that's where you're going to get the free download that I mentioned. So it's got some PDF questions in there, some more stuff on the Akashic Records. And then uh, I want to say that I'm leaving Facebook. I spent a lot of time there, but uh, it's hard to know what's going on with Facebook, but I do... I do spend a lot of time on Facebook more so than other platforms. So that's probably the best place for people to find me right now. Oh, well, thank you for coming on and sharing your wisdom with our listeners. Thank you so much for listening to the Dharma Life podcast. I do hope you enjoyed this episode. Please come over and say hello on my Instagram, our Facebook group. And also, please let me know what you thought. So if you are listening, please take a screenshot of the podcast that you are listening to tag me on Instagram and I will reshare your post and please let me know what it is that you got out of today's episode. Remember when we do our Dharma we are happier, healthier, we live longer and we have a deep sense of unshakable inner peace.